Hey botanists, thanks for joining me here in my backyard. We are going to be talking about Solanaceae. This is known as the nightshade family. You might also know it as the tomato family. Um, this is a picture of Brugmangia, and it reminds me that I wanted to tell you we're going to be talking about the ethnobotany of members of this family quite a bit today. Uh, that word ethnobotany, it's referring to the way that humans use plants. So things like medical, uh, medicinal, um, religious purposes, cultural purposes. Um, we're going to be talking about that in this family because there's lots of that. Uh, the first most maybe well-known member of the family is, of course, the tomato. And in the same genus of tomatoes, we also have potatoes, interestingly. So when we open up a tomato, if you've ever done that before, you already know they have a bunch of seeds and they also have these two chambers. Well, that's a feature that actually applies to all members of the family. So all members of this family are going to have a syncarpus gynecium of two fused carpels and many seeds per carpel. All right. Um, potatoes, of course, edible, also have some poisonous compounds, um, at least that can be formed in them. Have you ever let your potatoes go on your counter a little bit too long and they start forming those little eyes or buds? Those are actually poisonous and you've got to cut those off or at the very least cook them pretty well before you eat them. Um, lots of other poisonous members in this family, um, but here are some other non-poisonous ones. Eggplants, turns out things like jalapenos, bell peppers, cayenne peppers, all the peppers, um, all the tomatoes and potatoes are all in this family. Lots of other cool things, tomatillos. And this is a really cool charismatic member of the family that's called um, Chinese lantern plant. And what happens is these fruits which are actually these little structures inside. There's a fruit there, there's a fruit like right there and right there inside of these really cool netted structures. And this picture is what they look like when they're young. As they mature, as that fruit inside matures, um, you, you can't even really see what's going on in there because of this giant structure. And then over time, the kind of membranous parts of the leaf will fade away and then those veins leave this beautiful netted pattern and actually if you're kind of wondering like well what is that if the fruit is inside it's a calyx it's fused sepals and they actually just don't open they just leave the fruit inside it's pretty cool um so yep fused calyx that is a member of the family uh, a feature of the family solanaceae but this particular genus that we're looking at in this picture um, is really extreme in its fusion. Most members of the family still have an opening. Here, the calyx is completely fused. So we'll see lots of other pictures. For example, here, this is another member of the family. And we can't really see the calyx that well in this picture, but what you can at least tell is that the corolla has been exerted from the calyx. So that's the norm, obviously. I guess, kind of obviously, the flowers are generally exposed. Here's another picture of one, and then yet another one. Just wanted to kind of start showing you some diversity of typical flower of Solanaceae. And notice we have three very, very different looking flowers here. Um, some things that they do have in common is that they've got those five fused petals. You can really clearly tell that they're fused, at least like in this picture and in this one over here, they've got these elongate corolla tubes. But then, at least in this one that I'm drawing on right now, the corolla sort of does a 90 degree turn. So there's this long tube and then the rest of the corolla kind of lobes um, are spreading. And that's what's going on in the lower left one as well. Okay, these are three very different looking corolla shapes, and it turns out in this family that's just the case. We have lots of different shapes of corollas, and so we should at least go over a couple of those. That first one from the upper left picture, I'm going to kind of draw these relative to one another. Um, they had that long corolla tube, and then the petals are just doing a 90 degree turn from there. So there'd be like five petals or something. Sorry, that doesn't look that good. But this type of corolla shape, so this term is describing the shape of the entire corolla. This is called salverform, where we've got that elongate tube. And sometimes that uh, in a salverform flower, the tube isn't that elongate um, in the corolla. And then just for kind of clarity here. We also have those five few sepals. Those would be kind of below and down there. The other look, and I'm just going to draw these sort of relative to each other. Um, the other look was one like this, where it sort of looks like a funnel. And that's why they call this one funnel shaped. Or I also hear sometimes funnel form. Or, But I'm going to write funnel shaped because that's what the Jepson says. Funnel shaped. And again, 
we would have those sepals, five of them fused, always in the family. The other shape is sort of a shorter version of these, where the corolla, all of those petals are fused to one another, but there is no tube. So, sorry, those lobes, they look really bad. It's hard to draw this two-dimensionally. Um, but those corolla lobes, the, the point of this last one, which is called rotate, is that those lobes are just spreading. They do not form a tube. They're just spreading. They're, they're fused. And so some people call this wheel-shaped. <laughs> Again, which is sort of why it's sort of hard to draw, especially from a side view here. So, you know, you should just look these terms up. Just, like, do a Google search. Rotate corolla, and you'll get better pictures. Also, we'll show you some pictures here. So here's another well-known member of the family Petunia. This is uh, an ornamental plant. It doesn't have any kind of ethnobotanical use besides um, being pretty and especially, uh, these are especially pretty in hanging pots. You see these in people's front yards a lot. Petunias, they also kind of have that funnel form look. See this one that's sort of in the background here? You can sort of see that funnel form. Okay, some more ethnobotany. Do you know what this is? This is tobacco. These are big tobacco leaves. Tobacco is in the family Solanaceae. And so same with all nicotine products. They kind of come from this genus Nicotiana. Let me put that up there. So this is a plant that has been cultivated by humans for millennia and definitely has a strong ethnobotanical history. It has also caused a countless number of deaths. And it's a cool plant, but it's, it's, it's not something you should get hooked on. It is, has very highly, highly addictive properties. And I made this meme for you. These are the flowers of Nicotiana. They're really beautiful. They've got all the classic um, Solanaceae features, like the five fused petals. Now you can tell the look of that Corolla shape. What is it? Very good. Yes, it's silver form. <laughs> All right. Um, this is sort of a classic look of what Solanaceae can look like sometimes. Very herbaceous. They're almost always going to have these kind of boring, simple alternate leaves. I don't have much exciting anything to say about that. Oh, but there is something else about this. Where those compounds in nicotine actually come from are glands. So all over this plant, if we were to look really closely, like under a microscope or something, we would see that each of the individual hairs have a little kind of lump on the top. They're sort of globular. They're actually very sticky as well. And it's usually those kind of globs at the tops of these trichomes that the secondary compounds of this family are found in. Here's another member of the family, Brugmangia. These are huge, huge flowers. We're talking like the size of my head and just in their opening down here. These are really big, big flowers. They're facing down. They have a very strong aroma. Bats are interested in these things. It's called Brugmangia. There's a close relative of this one that looks kind of similar. It's called Datura. Both of these have hallucinogenic properties. Lots of members of this family, in fact, um, also kind of have this important ethnobotanical history of being used with many cultures and spiritual awakening type of experiences uh, for these hallucinogenic properties that are found in them. People have known about for millennia. This one has a very different type of property, though. Beautiful flower. Check it out. It's called Atropa belladonna. This is known as the deadly nightshade. Really beautiful flowers. And it's actually not in the same genus as Solanum, whose common name is nightshade. We kind of have, you know the issue with common names. Sometimes the common name is in multiple genera. That's what's going on here. <clears throat> the flower is pretty. Fruit's also pretty, but highly, highly poisonous. Just a very small number of these fruits can totally just kill someone. Um, Interestingly, though, there, you might be wondering, well, belladonna, that actually means pretty lady or pretty woman. Um, it turns out that if you use this in extremely small quantities, please don't do this. People don't do this anymore, what I'm about to say. But back in the day, people would, would dilute this and find the right concentration, and then women would drop them in their eyeballs so that their pupils would dilate. And apparently, big black eyeballs are pretty to um, people back then. Very confusing. <laughs> uh, but yes, one of the side effects of hallucinogenic things, and also a, a lot of members of this family are pupated, uh, dilated pupils, and this is what happens with deadly nightshade. You kind of end up having hallucinations before you die. <laughs> oh, side note, that's my roller derby name. Solanum. 
This is the genus of nightshade. This is your required genus. It's the only required genus in the family. Everything else we've been talking about before this slide have been kind of family-wide features. So about selenum, this is the genus nightshade. Did I say that? Yes. Okay. Here's two different looks. It's actually a really big genus. And you might have grown this in your backyard as tomatoes, but it turns out we actually have many native members of the genus selenum here in California. We have two very different looking flowers here. Um, they have kind of very different shapes. This one on the left has these really prominent lobes in the corolla, while this one on the right just sort of uh, doesn't have prominent lobes. Instead, all the lobes kind of blend into one another, more or less. Yeah, well, that's just different looks, different colors. We also have kind of darker purple ones. We see something cool in this genus, something that's not found in other members of the family, or maybe just a couple other members of the family. Um, so this is sort of un more or less unique to Solanum within the family, but we have seen it in another family. We saw it in Ericaceae. See how this um, this bumblebee is hovering? It's, it's kind of hanging on this flower. Well, it's buzzing. And that's the only way for pollen to come out of those little anthers, because these are not normal anthers. Normal anthers open sort of like this, where they'll split and pollen will just start pouring out of them. These ones instead only open by these tiny little holes right at the very tip of the anther, and this is called porocytal anther dehiscence, as you remember. So pollen, um, this is a mistake. I, I got this picture from the internet. Pollen does not just drop out of these holes. No, you can flick it with your finger, you can blow on it and try to get pollen out. It won't work unless you're a bee or unless you have a tuning fork and you can vibrate this entire flower. That's the only way to get pollen to actually come out of those holes. Just some more kind of eye candy, some more looks of the genus Selenum for you. Can you tell which, which of those three Corolla types that we talked about earlier this one has? Genus Selenum? Yes, you're right. It has a rotate Corolla. Not salver form, not really funnel form. You can really clearly see it in this one. And again, the salver, or sorry, the um, rotate Corolla is, it sort of has nothing to do with the fact that this picture on the right the petals are very deeply lobed, or sorry, the corolla has kind of deep lobes in it, as opposed to the picture on the left where the corolla has virtually no apparent lobes. They're still both rotate. Something else about the anthers. We've talked about the buzz pollination. Something we can very clearly see in this picture now, though, we couldn't really see it as well in the other one, is that these, this is actually five anthers. It sort of looks like an anther tube almost, where they're all connected and re you can really see it in this one too. It just looks like they're all totally connected. But actually, if you were to touch one, like I kind of did in this one right here, I kind of poked it before I took this picture and you notice that they are actually not fused. They are just held very, very, very close together. So as to, so much so as to appear fused. So they're like this, right? And then if you touch them, then they'll come apart, but they look like they're fused. So the term for this, we saw it in the genus Viola a while back. Um, do you remember the term for it? Yes, it's conovent. These um, flowers have conovent anthers. Just means he held very close together. Okay, a couple more slides. Just another look. Sometimes I do have these fancy little green spots. Those are probably to attract pollinators to where the exact location that they need to go, targeting the center, those anthers. And here's a look at some of their fruits. Oh, I forgot to talk about the fruit type of the family, the kind of classic fruit type. Well, it's a berry. If you know about tomatoes, then you know, you might know that tomatoes are berries. They're from the ovary. I don't know who decided that they were vegetables in the first place, but that is the that is so incredibly wrong. There's nothing vegetative about them. These are fruits. They're matured ovaries. That's the botanical definition of a fruit. So please correct people when you hear people calling them um, vegetables. That is so wrong. Quick note going back, sorry, backtracking. Other members of this family, not genus Solanum, other members of this family have capsules sometimes. So we just have two types of fruits in this family, either berry like Solanum or capsule like other things. Right, eggplants, potatoes, tomatoes are all in this genus, surprisingly in the same genus. Couldn't find any appropriate eggplant memes, so I'll leave you with this one. See you next time.